Some people are more bottom than others. Of course, that's just about as insulting as you can possibly get. Hit me. Party at the Church of Scientology. Let me drop some science on Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard's weird sci-fi philosophy. They cloud theology. Top secrecy, technology, mythology, and no apology. 1952 was when it all began. Started on a bet by a frustrated man. His books weren't selling, so everyone thought fast. He started his own religion and make a lot of cash. Alien rulers, past lies, tone scales, copywritten text, and scary emails. Shutting up the critics, core battles left and right. Mysterious deaths in the middle of the night. Personality tests, e meters narking on. Times Square recruitment from dusk to dawn. All this from the guy who wrote Battlefield Earth. Submission for a feel and see what your soul's worth There's a place in Florida where you got friends For help you present if you give us those ends Party at the church in Scientology Don't call it a cult, you just don't understand Write us a check and take our hand Party at the church in Scientology Actors are a target for their army of elite They feed their self-esteem and make them feel complete They mess with their minds just look at Tom Cruise Jumping on the couch during Oprah's interview. John Travolta fights Satan's in his Florida estate Piloting his plane, Dianetics books on tape Bet counts past lives in a temple in Bel Air Katie Holmes stays home and plays pregnant solitaire Isaac Hayes still pays to reach that upper level state But left South Park when they hated on his face Sonny Bolo made donations, should have bought better skis Dougie Search frequents haters on the mic as he sees. Juliette Lewis, Jason Lee, and Shaka Khan Because of L. Ron, all their money is gone Shikaria, Kirstie Alley, and Nancy Cartwright Hope's weekly prayer circles on the UFO headlines Once you step into the temple, your troubles will be gone We'll get you back on track, everybody sing along Party at the church in Scientology Don't listen to the lies, you know they're all untrue So why not come right down, cause we're waiting for you Party at the church in Scientology So that's Scientology, P-S-E-U-D-O R-E-L-I-G-I, -I one you person, now you know They drain your cash fast, so as long as you agree You can put up rise on freedom when it's coming COD Okay, they ruin lives and it sounds like science fiction What about Noah's art, Jesus, and the crucifixion? Faith is subjective, you can't say who's right or wrong Though I'll probably end up missing just for writing this song Hey, did you guys hear that the Easter Bunny's bringing Bigfoot to the meeting tonight? What's up? What's up? Welcome. It's Colts in the Satanic Panic. We got a full house tonight. We got the Meaty Wench here as a co host. What's up, Meaty Wench? Hey, hey, hey. And uh looks like uh, Apostate Alex has decided to ruin his fucking reputation by coming on our show. What's up, Apostate oh! Alex? <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, it's 5 oh, a.m. there. For you guys. It's 5 a.m. there. Are you up late or up early? Up early. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yikes. <laughs> Just for you, Dave. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, con man only comes once. Thank you for uh, following this channel. And you did. Uh, don't don't be swayed. You did, uh, by the way, uh, win Plinko. I just don't have room for the Plinko on the three people overlay. There's no uh, no way to fit all that shit on the screen. Anyway, Alex, how you doing, man? Good to have you on. Good. Yeah. How are you doing? It's been a long time coming. Hi. Um, I'm I'm okay. You know, working working real hard, and um, had a lovely dinner with my family today. Um, their cats. Um. I don't know, avoided me this time. I have a fraught relationship with their cats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got another new follower. Italian Joe is following the channel. The uh, It seems like Twitch has uh, spawned a new generation of baby Twitchers that are doing the things that you know we tried to do like six years ago. It's okay. You can just chat and play with them and we can move along. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. So... Um, we're, one of the things we're going to do, and we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, we're going to watch the Scientology video about the London org, because that's where, uh, Alex was, uh, stationed. And, uh, we got yeah. Justin Freakin with the fucking goats. What the fuck is, everything's happening right now. We got PP girl 420 <laughs> following the channel. All kind of things are happening that don't make us any money. Fantastic. Hooray. <laughs> 
people might not necessarily know uh, who you are, uh, Alex. So that's a weird thing to say. Hey, who are you? Um, but no, how did you how did you come to be doing like anti Scientology activism? Yeah, really good question. Um, so I was in Scientology as a teenager and then left and went about my own business. And it was about 10 years later that um, I realized I was still thinking about Scientology, like in a Scientology way, and still doing stuff that was Scientology-like. Um, so just started going down that rabbit hole of, you know, I googled Scientology for the first time after 10 years and was amazed at what I found. Um, and so, yeah, just went down that route and then one thing led to another, started my channel on YouTube and, um, yeah, now I'm the biggest pain in their backside in the UK. <laughs> well, that's a good place to be. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, the UK, uh, in addition to being a big pain in the ass of the Scientologists, what I, what I, what I like about what you're doing is that you are, um, trying to like do some civic engagement with, um, like members of the government to try mm. to. Like, e even if all you're doing is putting a little worm in their ear about the cult of Scientology and like that they in the future may be less trustful of the organization. I don't know. Well, you know how much, uh, you know, you're not going to have instant success. But even if that's just it, that, that even if you're just getting getting uh, people involved in uh, government, be it local or at the minister parliament level or whatever, getting people sort of interested in maybe maybe if they just have their one of their staffers take a look, that's that's great. Yeah, I think that this is the thing. There's no right or wrong way to protest or be an activist. Like everyone brings their own thing to the table. You know, there are people live streaming outside the orgs and stopping people joining. And there's there's merit and value to that. I'm not saying what I'm doing is better or the only I'll, I'll way you it. should be doing it. But <laughs> but for me, I just think, hey, what Dave, can I bring it. to the table and what am I good at? And I'm good at building relationships. I'm good at um, you know, talking to people, that's what I do for a job is, is relationship building. So, um, I just think, look, what no one's really, there's lots of talk about Scientology on YouTube and such in the UK. John atac has been doing a really good job for many years and, and many others, but there wasn't anyone doing the, the government stuff. So I thought, let's jump in and see what I can do. And so, yeah, started trying to meet with members of parliament and with, um, investigators and the tax office and all of this, and just saying, kind of firstly educating them and going hey look scientology has been in the uk since 1959 um and they've been doing nefarious things ever since and people seem to have forgotten rulings like in the um i think it was the 80s might be in the 90s um there was a ruling where a high court judge ruled that scientology was a cult that preys upon the young and the vulnerable and yet here we are in 2024 it's still going on. They haven't changed anything about their operation. They still have, you know, children going on and up the bridge um, and doing the purification rundown, which is a dangerous program to be doing. It's very when, dangerous. Especially when you're uh, young. Uh, a, a friend of mine, <clears throat> her ex-husband, who she was still had a pretty good relationship with, you know, they just weren't married anymore. Um, <clears throat> she believes that the Purif actually was one of the things that contributed to his life uh, ending. Yeah. When he, when, when he got it, off, he was off his heart med. He, they didn't tell him to completely quit, but they told him to stop taking his heart medication during the Purif. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a couple of weeks after he finished the Purif, he had, he had passed away of um, like, complications from heart disease. It was a very sad story. It's horrible. And, and unfortunately, that, that case isn't isolated. There are lots of instances of people doing the purification rundown of services in Scientology because Scientology believe that you know, psychiatric drugs and any medication you're on is all stuff that can be avoided as long as you apply Scientology correctly. Because Scientology will fix all of your problems because all of your illnesses are just in the mind. You know, it's not an infection caused by bacteria or anything like that. No, it's it's you've allowed yourself um, to put yourself in a situation where that can happen. So, you know, it, it, they encourage people to stop taking their prescribed meds and, you know, couple that with dangerously high doses of niacin and, you know, interrogations and objective auditing and all this sort of stuff. It just ends up being a really dangerous cocktail. And unfortunately, people have passed away from doing the program. So for me, it really grinds my gears when kids are being forced to do this program at St. Hill. And so it's not just politicians I'm speaking with, but it's also the authorities and going, hey, this program is child abuse, right? You know, this need and it's been going on for years and people should be looking into it. So, yes, there's the protests and the activism like that. There's interviews and stuff I'm doing on my channel. But 
um there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that a lot of people don't see um that is also kind of contributing towards the fight in any way that i can that's funny pete jensen in the chat says i hear they prescribe plenty of cigarettes and the first time i spoke with karen de la carriere <laughs> one of the things she said me said to me is boy do these motherfuckers smoke cigarettes <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because Ella Rach said it was okay to smoke. <laughs> In fact, actually, it's it's beneficial to your health. Uh, your health, apparently. Yeah, because yeah, that's a famous, famously uh, health smart big tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have a huge problem with big pharma, but they don't have a problem with big tobacco. <laughs> yeah, Doctor Marlboro says at least three packs a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 wild. I just and um. You know, I don't want to spend uh, I don't want to spend any time on um, unfolding chaos, but there there's there's a way in which I'm kind of glad that a nice guy like you is all the way over there in London. So you, you're like, <laughs> there's an ocean between you and the American anti Scientologists. <laughs> I mean, you're yeah, safe it, over there. there's also a lot of people forget this There's a big cultural difference, right? Americans and British people are very different in many ways. There are a lot of similarities, of course, but the way that we go about things here in the UK and in Europe is different to how pe the people go about things in America. That's just in general in life. Um, so a lot of people look at the activism I'm doing and saying, oh, why can't the Americans do it like that? Alex is doing it the right way. There is no right or wrong way. Everyone can do what they want to do. That's the freedom of, <laughs> that's the beauty of freedom of speech and being able to do what you want to do. It's just about, you know, how effective that is and, and, what you're putting into it and for me um i feel like i can add value by contacting politicians and doing that sort of stuff and um, but i also do do live streams outside orgs and go in um protest and that sort of thing it's all it's different cogs in the machine in the fight against scientology and every single one is helpful so what i liked about your protest is that um there was like lead up to it and like education mm. and uh marketing and promotion around it um, so that you you got a good turnout and people brought signs and I I thought it was I thought it was it was like a protest right it wasn't thank you it, yeah I just thought that there was the the prep work was was done oh. and I think that's like really important you know I think people were generally on message and you know. yeah I think I think there two there's two there two different types of protest right like showing up at an org outside a building and live streaming and protesting that way is a very different kind of protest to the one or the two that I've organized. And that's because they like the, the protest outside the IES event, which was at St. Hill was very much, there was a purpose. It was a one-off thing. So it was planned. I built relationships with the police and I said, Hey, look, this is what we're going to do and got the permits and the road closure and all that sort of stuff because it was a, a one-off event. The same in, in March for the LRH birthday event. And and so the way you go about that is different to just rocking up outside Nork with a camera phone and, and doing a live stream. They're different types of protests and therefore the organization was different. Um, that doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It's just a different kind of thing. There's no point in building relationships with the police force and letting them know you're going to organize a static protest if you're going to be there every single day. It's just you don't need to do that. But if you're going to show up en masse and there's going to be 46 or 48 of you or whatever marching in the road that's the sort of thing you kind of need to plan for to see you can stop the traffic <laughs> and that sort of thing and here in america actually no matter what your protest movement is there's probably actually no value in uh, coordinating with the police anyway because they just know where to <laughs> point their firearms honestly <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's another big difference the police here and the police in the u.s i mean in the UK, they were very a bit nervous when I first said, hey, we're going to protest. Ultimately, you can protest wherever you want in the UK. You don't have to get any permits or anything like that unless you want to do a march. If you're literally moving along the road from one place to another, you have to get a permit for that. Um, but they're just they're, they they're very fair here. And, you know, because I'd done that work, educating them on what we're going to do, what we're not going to do, why we're there. They were less concerned about us becoming violent or rowdy because I'd put the hours in to to prep for that. Um, whereas in America, you know, the protests that you've seen are, are much more showing up live streaming on the day rather than big organized one off events. I imagine if there was a big one off protest like the one that I organized last year, if there was something like that in America, it would be similar because you would have to build relationships to the police and say, hey, where can we be? Where can we not be? Don't worry, we're not going to be violent. We just want to send a message to people inside that we're here to help them if they can, um, if they want to leave. 
And the police at the end of it actually said that this, it was one of the most peaceful, nicest group of protesters they've, they've ever worked with, which is a nice little compliment. I said, yeah, look, we're not here to cause trouble. We're here to let well, Scientologists know that if they want to leave, we can help. Sorry? You're there to cause good trouble. Good trouble. <laughs> yeah, and there was a lot of planning as well in terms of, like, um, making sure we don't cause too much disruption to the local community and, you know, traffic management plans and all this sort of stuff, health and safety, because I wanted to make sure that, look, we're not there to stop people going to the IES event. There are thousands of Scientologists that have travelled all over Europe to go to this event. We're not here to stop them going onto the property because that's illegal. We're here just to let them know that, you know, there's a community of people that can support them if they want to leave and try and send them that message that we're all nice and we're kind and we're, we're helpful um, rather than these big, scary, suppressive people that want to destroy you in every way, which is what Scientology tell them we are. And I mean, here in America, we did have a version of that. There was that one day, it was like the global protest actually put on by Anonymous, but there were a there were a ton of people out in front of Big Blue. If you've seen those videos, it wasn't yeah. like it wasn't like thousands, but it was hundreds. And they, yeah. they, they, it was before I guess before everybody thought they needed to film everything in their lives. So people brought signs and they were chanting. People like made friends probably who are still fucking friends today from that event. They were all wearing yeah. the that that mask, which now unfortunately, if you see that mask on someone's profile, it doesn't doesn't mean that they're against Scientology anymore. It means they probably believe in chemtrails or think the earth is flat or something now. That's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> which is probably more in line with what Scientologists believe, because they're all big conspiracy <clears throat> theory nuts. <laughs> yeah, one of the, one of the things I heard about Scientology that that sort of tracks is with their anti, you know, sort of anti-modern medicine thing that the cult of Scientology itself isn't necessarily anti-vax, but there are a lot of anti-vaxxers who are Scientologists. Yeah, I think, so think about it this way, Scientology believes that the, 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 the kind of idea is that Scientology is the only way to save the planet, and one of the main reasons that they come up against so much, um, you know, in terms of legal cases, government trying to clamp down on them, and why they're attacked so much, is because the government know that Scientology is the only solution, and they're trying to stop it, because they're all part of this global conspiracy. So that's the general belief, which leads a lot of Scientologists to become these big conspiracy theory nuts. Like, there was, do you know the film Loose Change? That is all about the original you know one about the 9-11 thing. Is we were going to watch that last night, but my co-host, because he had never seen it, but my co-host was not feeling well because yesterday was 9-11. We were going to watch that for our intellectual dollar tree. Right. And I ended up not watching it because he wasn't well. Yeah, I, I, we, yeah. I, I've seen it. Well, the first time I left staff um, on my last day, the director of special affairs, so the OSA representative at London Org, sat me in a room and said, hey, you need to watch this. And he played Loose Change <laughs> in, while I was in the Org. And I was like 16 or 17 or something. And he came in afterwards. He was like, do you see now why you need to stay on staff? I'm like, no, this is a video about 9-11. What on earth has <laughs> this got to do with Scientology? He's like, these are the people we're up against. That is why they are trying so hard to shut us down and stop us expanding because of this blah, 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 blah. And I was like... Wow, you guys are actually quite crazy, but they genuinely, <laughs> they genuinely believe that they're the ones doing good, and that's what they're up against. They're up against this new world order and all of that stuff. So yeah, it, it, the, the belief system, if you want to call it that, does lend itself to conspiracy theories. And so when the you know vaccines and stuff ended up happening, it was like, no, they're just going to implant everyone, and we need to not do it. And you know, you remember all illness is psychosomatic caused by the mind. Scientology can stop you getting COVID. You just need to apply Scientology. So that's so weird because their public messaging around uh, COVID was, was the other way. Do you remember all those videos that they were making showing how they were like cleaning everything? And I'm surprised they yeah. didn't have videos pretending to like be inventing vaccines and shit. I. I was like well, really yeah, surprised it, that they went with like the like the the recommended uh, protocol yeah. for the most part around well, it's COVID. All the PR thing, and also I think the Sea Org members and people certainly around David Miscavige had to get the vaccine. Like it was mandated among staff. Um, however, Scientologists generally, again, it's not a church-imposed belief, but Scientologists generally would be under the assumption that you don't need the vaccine. 
Um, but yeah, the whole reason they're going around spraying churches and buildings and trying to help is all a PR front because mm. they're trying to come across as a legitimately helpful organization. So right. any opportunity that they can exploit to, to come across in that way, they will do so. So they're like, oh, everyone's scared about these germs and these pandemics, you know, this whole you know, COVID thing. Well, what a great thing. We can get tons of footage and pictures of us cleaning stuff. And we'll be seen <laughs> as the heroes. It's an easy tick box thing for them. Yeah, that was that was real surprising. Uh, someone asked in the <laughs> chat, are there any Scientologists living high life with Ferraris? And I think that I think oh, uh, I'll rephrase the question. Are the do do you has your experience been that like the whales, the big donors, do they also do they tend to live flashy lifestyles or do they tend to give so I mean, I don't think that the whales are giving so much of their money to the church that they can't go buy a Ferrari, but I'm just wondering, are the, the whales are out, maybe outside of Grant Cardone, would they be inclined to be like flossing and like showing off their money or do they try <laughs> to keep it, they try to keep it kind of on the sneak that they have that kind of, uh, that kind of cash. I mean, look, the, the, um, spectrum of wealthy Scientologists is so great. You know, you have some people like Grant Cardone, you mentioned who, is very flashy and i've got all this money i've got private jets and you know behind the scenes will say the reason i'm so successful is because of scientology you know tom cruise with his jets and his helicopters and so on but you also have families particularly here in the uk that have donated millions of pounds and they don't have any cash but they have lots of property that they sell or remortgage or you know they borrow money so they're donating a lot um, but they don't have a very good, like, good cash flow, um, so they're not so flashy. But they are donating lots of money. Um, you know, there are a lot of people like Nancy Cartwright. She's not a huge, flashy, you know, fancy cars type person, but she donates millions of dollars. I think the spectrum of Scientologist is just like any other spectrum in the world. I was, I was curious about that. So the answer is, yeah, sort of. I guess maybe, maybe just, just... <laughs> some, some of them, yeah, just like in any other group of people. Some of them will be flashy. Some of them won't. I mean, maybe it just tracks with whether or not the person is a uh, celebrity because celebrities are going to tend to be, be flashy. Or, and so it has nothing to do with the cult. To be, yeah. Or wants the status, wants to be seen as flashy with money. You know, there's one or two um, Scientologists in the UK that aren't very famous, but they're big donors and they will rock up to the IS event with their McLaren F1 or in their Bentley or Rolls Royce. And they'll be, Hey, look, I'm a, you know, big guy that's just rocked up with loads of money and I'm donating loads. But there are also people who, you know, Sheila Gaiman is a prime example. Um, you know, there's David and Neil Gaiman. That whole family are huge whales. They donate millions every year to Scientology. Um, but they live in a modest kind of apartment in a shared building just opposite St. Hill. Um, so yeah, some are flashy, some aren't. So we have funny questions in the chat. Uh, could you make Dave's window smaller and Alex's larger and leave the media wenches window the same size? So these are the, <laughs> these are the important questions that people are asking. <laughs> I can move my camera like that. Is that better? <laughs> oh my God. Oh, my chat is so fucking weird. So, <laughs> so, we're going to watch oh, this video the here. stuff right there. <laughs> I, I think we're going to watch this. Oh yeah, we'll do, we'll do before we watch this video. We'll do, we'll talk about the ultimate load. Not only can you take a load, you can take the ultimate load. All right. So we're going to watch this video about the, the, uh, the destination Scientology, the London org. We tend to turn off Scientology TV when it's destination Scientology. <laughs> um, it's the, probably the second worst show or the third media one. What, what's the worst show? Oh, Voice for Humanity. It's got to be the worst show. I, I uh, Or Meet a Scientologist fucking sucks. Uh, I Am a Scientologist is just another Meet a Scientologist. Yeah, which is just another Voice for Humanity. <laughs> it's just, it's all, it's all bad. It's all so bad. I would rather watch the printing press again than any of those three shows. Create, Create, Create is also the best. I, Create, create, create is the best. I also enjoy the boat episodes. I really, I, I like boat because it just. I don't know how. I don't know how either of you find any sort of entertainment or enjoyment in it at all. It's just all <laughs> because we're we're we are awful, cynical people <laughs> who have been so overly exposed to the <clears throat> the internet that nothing we are incensed to fucking everything and just pick apart the most. The, the dumbest minutia that you could possibly <laughs> seek out in anything. 
And uh, here's one from the soundboard that we were asked for. And I think it was in a reference to the uh, question that was asked about uh, camera sizes. Uh, sir, madam, person, camera, woman, whatever. <laughs> All right. We're I never going to start this video if we don't start this video. So let's start this video. <laughs> this is Destination Scientology, <laughs> London. <laughs> little bit of context just before you press play is I very narrowly escaped being in this video. I only left a few months before they showed up to film it. Oh shit. Ooh, so, I wonder yeah. if, does our friend does our friend Charlie show up in this? He's the centerpiece. Oh good. Oh fun. Oh, great. <laughs> Fucking great. What do you feel is most unique about London? There he is. Ooh, big question. Um... Are you being deposed? <laughs> <laughs> he seems like a nervous type. He's not. He's just thinking. Feels freestyle standing. Fish and chips would have to be top of the list. <laughs> oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me. I hate this. <laughs> He used to be my best mate, Dave. He opened up like 10,000 internet tabs in his brain, and that was the one that he ended up on. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's really difficult with me or Charlie, because like, he was my best mate, and there is still... He never did anything wrong to me, and as much as I haven't spoken to him for like a year or something now, but like, I don't know, there's still an element of me that's like, he's my mate. So there's kind of like, look, don't take the piss out of my mate. But also, like, yeah, he is a Scientologist and he is just as bad as the rest of them. And we're not friends anymore. So well, like, like it's you're, just a difficult one. You're just nicer than we are. That's okay. Right. It, it takes all sorts, friend. It takes all sorts. I will only take light shots. I will not. Nothing disparaging. Like somebody's Also, I love how they like, played like 30 fun. seconds of the film and then we're straight into ads already. <laughs> Notice how it's not an ad for a Jeep or anything, though? It's like an ad for themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this could be like an ad for the Travel Channel, too, though. This is like, the, it's, it's, except for that. <laughs> Except for the, the Scientology thing. <laughs> London in its history. Yeah, the Travel Channel turned into the Ghost Channel, that's right. Architecture, because we have all the way from thousands of years ago up until the most common and cutting edge architecture. <laughs> And it makes for an incredibly beautiful, aesthetic uh, city to look at. So you get that very nice mix of the old and the new. That's Craig. He's now the executive director. He's the big boss now. He wasn't at the time, but he's just come back from FLAG, having trained on the OEC FEBC, which is the organization executive course and the FLAG executive briefing course. It's these big, huge green volumes of like like hardback books with all of the policies LRH ever wrote about how to run an organization and the golden age of admin which is the uh, big course that Craig and many others just finished involves reading and studying all of these policies from cover to cover three times over I'm surprised they even let Craig have a name because usually like on the on these videos <laughs> it just says like you know staff lead or whatever they don't even let the person mm -hmm. have a name in most of these it's videos It's manager yeah, well, you'll notice, so a, a lot of these people are all second, third generation Scientologists, like Charlie's grandfather is the one who first joined Scientology, and 
the same with um you know craig the miltons like they are huge whale families they're not just staffers like they are paying you know their families are, are keeping scientology afloat in the uk so they're like the most dedicated they're never going to leave they're going to be in for life so they're kind of low risk but they eliminate the risk by not putting their last names in there and you'll notice there are a couple of people in this who they don't give names they just go <laughs> parishioner and they're yeah, just how much does it cost the question now is not how much does it cost to learn about Xenu, but how much does it cost to get them to put your fucking name on when you <laughs> make do commentary during Scientology TV? That's basically it. Yeah, for sure. Like being second or third generation in, you're privileged to even have a name like in real life. <laughs> well, um, Charlie himself has donated a million dollars to the International Association of Scientology. London historically is the center of the English speaking world. It's the, the This is Kate, that's Charlie's wife. Touched so many parts of this. His world. wife, you say? Yeah. London is absolutely fantastic. It's vibrant. It's the rain. She's the executive director of the Foundational, which is evenings and weekends. I chose London because it was big. It's also for the name, right? It's London. Who doesn't want to be here and, or at least experience it once in their lives? So, Sandrine, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep interrupting this video. Is that okay? Is that what yeah, you want to do? Yeah, that's fine. Have you Sandrine ever, you've, is you've, you've, I know you've never watched my channel or engaged in the chat or anything. It's your first time here in ship. Yeah, we do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go by all means. <laughs> better, better you than us. <laughs> Sandrine, who was just there, is an interesting one because she joined after I left. She's new to Scientology. She wasn't raised in it. She wasn't brought up in it. Um, she joined, she used to be a lawyer, and now she works in uh, Division 6, which is the public-facing division, so recruiting people in. Um, so essentially, every time you see Sandrine is a time you would have seen me if I was still in, because she took my role. So I left, she was recruited to replace me, and then now she's in this video. So it's interesting that she's got a name, because she's not second or third gen. She's not. You know, she hasn't donated millions. <laughs> Maybe they have, like, maybe, maybe they have high hopes. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe her auntie is like uh, part, you know, part of some royal family somewhere, and they got high hopes for her or something. <laughs> no, this there been is a actually a story. I know why she's there, but I'm not sure I'm prepared to uh, no, share that. That's just personal. There that's is also, a reason. That's also like personal stuff about these people are victims of this cult too. So, like, I yeah. mean, I'm an asshole, but I'm not that big an asshole. But I did want to ask, what do you think, what, what would have happened had you been in this video? Would, the, would they have reshot it? Um, yeah, probably. I mean, if I was in this and then let, they would have firstly taken it down and tried to remove any trace of this video ever existing. And then depending on how badly they needed the shot, they would either go back and they would release a new version that's exactly the same. They've just removed the bits with me in it. Or they would reshoot and get someone else to say the lines that I said. Um, it just depends on what Dave Miscavige's priorities were. Considering they're always scrambling for content, I'd imagine they would take it down. And then when they release their new season of amazing flashy content, there would be a new episode about London that was completely different because they need to you know, look like they're spending their money on producing actual content. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, the new season came out and we were excited about it. And then we were disappointed to find that the new season was just like the same old shows with like a couple new scenes. Like they didn't. <laughs> it's like yeah. when a chem trailer makes a video off of somebody else's chem trailer stuff. Yeah, it's sort of iterative in, in that way and almost as stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll watch it, I guess. gives <laughs> is an ability for people to express themselves, you know? Like you can really be who you are, wherever you're from in the world, whatever language you speak, you're very welcome in London. Unless, Unless you're, you're an ex-Scientologist. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, well... <laughs> that's the main org where I used to work. Probably a couple instances where that's not so true for it. So, you see all these people walking around, right? This is hilarious. Because they used to film stuff like this all the time because they have international events every year um, where, you know, we'd have, there was the IES event, there's the Maiden Voyage, there's the Birthday Game event. Basically, these, these huge international events where thousands of Scientologists get together and listen to David Miscavige trotting up on stage talking about how wonderful they are and how much expansion there's been over the year. 
But obviously throughout the year they're always filming stuff. So for example, a shot like this, they came to London Org, it's not this exact shot, but um, they came to London Org to film me book selling and how well we've been doing because um, we we smashed it and we were growing and selling, you know, 200 books a week rather than 20 books a week, which was what we were doing before I joined. Um, and so they came to film and they're like, we need to film how busy London Org is because you're selling all of these books. But, you know, 200 books a week, that means, you know, a couple of people a day, you know, it's not like it's going to be really busy. So we would get staff members to take off their uniform and put T-shirts on and pretend to be members of the public walking in. And the same with um, people who are currently on course upstairs in the course room. We'd take them down and say, hey, we just need to get like a 30 second shot. Can you just walk from this corner to this corner when we say action? So all of these shots like this are all staged and most of them are staff members. They're not actual people. It's never that busy in the org. So and, and this is a question me and the media went have actually been sort of uh, debating this. Do they do you, like do they use people from central casting? for some of these videos or is it all literally right. everybody you see in this is either a Scientologist or some idiot from Xerox who they tricked into being in their video to talk about uh, a, yeah, a that, printing machine that Xerox created, but the Scientology actually invented. <laughs> they use, they'll use casting agents for the training films and things like that, that they use to deliver Scientology services. But all of the stuff like this, it will all be public Scientologists and or staff members with the exception of if they need to make it look busier. So there was one time I was standing outside Tottenham Court Road and we needed to make it look really busy, but there were only three staff members. So I literally went to the the park around the corner and I said to all these like local office workers that were just sat there eating their lunch, hey guys, we're making a film and we need some people just to sit down to get this one shot to make it look busy. Do you want to be in our film? So I got a couple of people to come in and sit down and watch a display panel video just to make it look busy. So often there will be things like that being staged. But for the local org videos, all of these, it won't be they don't they won't hire people to do it. They'll just find as many people as they can. But the training videos are definitely um, paid actors. Fair enough. So the answer is we were both wrong. <laughs> the answer is it depends what film. Some of them are actors, some of them are not. If it's Scientology TV promo stuff about an org or about a location, it will generally be real life people. Well, not that actors aren't real life people, but you know what I mean. <laughs> well, I mean, they're real people, I suppose. Yeah. I think actors are real. But that's what I mean, like real people as opposed to paid actors. I've tried to work this out for many years. Whenever I've tried to put people in pockets of like age brackets or career or ethnicity, it just hasn't worked. This. Right. So that person there, sorry, I'm, I promise I won't. Please, no, no, no. no. I, you need to promise to keep doing this because we don't want to actually watch this fucking video, Alex. <laughs> So you see that clip that we just saw of someone standing at the reception desk and someone walking in and then shaking their hand. So that's the public information center. So the first shot we saw where we last stopped was the main reception to the building. If you walk in and say, hey, I want a tour of the church, you won't get a tour of the church. You'll get a tour of the public information center, which is what we're seeing now. So when you go up in an ideal organization, there are so many staff members, there's like a reception desk in every single area of the org. So you go in and you see the receptionist and they and you go, hi, I'm here to see the public information centre. And the receptionist goes, sure, this way, please, which is what we just saw. There were never enough staff members to ever have someone sat on that desk ever. Like there's there was one person, me, that would go down and take them on the tour of the information centre. So the fact that they've got a staff member to stand there just to make it look like that that post has been filled to Scientologists watching it. They go, wow, London Org is huge. They're expanding. It must just be our org that's empty because they're so busy. They've got a staff member in that position, which is the least important position in the org. <clears throat> right. Like the one thing that we, we, we clocked about the Scientology network, like as soon as it dropped is that it wasn't actually uh, designed for like me or uh, media wench or any, like any outside person to be watching it. It was clearly designed to like reinforce for the whales, maybe to reinforce like what we're doing. Oh, look, we have this great TV channel that we're using your money for. And for regular people, like you just said, regular people in there, they could like pretend that these orgs in these um, big cities like London, Barcelona, maybe San Francisco, you know, when they do these, they make it look like it's cracking. 
so that the people yeah. inside think there's more more Scientology than there really is. Yeah, and it's it's all staged. Like, you know, they we borrowed people from the local park to make it look busy, so that then on the international stage, all of the Scientologists are thinking, wow, London's really busy, they've got that many people there all the time. And it's like, oh, it must just be our org that's empty, which means we're not doing it right. You know, it's not all of the orgs around the world are suffering because Scientology is shrinking. It's just us. Because look at all of this footage of all of these orgs that are always really busy. They don't realize that it's all staged. Right, that they're being, they're being hoodwinked, you might say. Yeah, they're being lied to. They're being manipulated. <laughs> Corn sparkle. Someone comes in and they find what it is that they want to study or they want to learn about or they want to improve and then they take that into their own life. When it connects, they just, they, they just blossom and they do amazing and it's the most beautiful thing to see. So Kate there, she's actually Oxford trained. She went to Oxford University and got a degree and now she's there. Did, did she get that while she was in Scientology? Because I'm not sure that they'd let you do that. No, she was raised in Scientology, but she wasn't on staff. So yeah. she was a Scientologist, but went and did her studies finished university, and then with her Oxford University degree decided, I know the best thing to do with my life is to go and work for the Church of Scientology for £20 a week. <laughs> it's a shame. That old guy's Graham, he's a legend. <laughs> Scientology is very much something that you discover for yourself. And at the very end of the course, the smile and the look on their face is actually priceless. So that guy on the left is he's a staff member pretending to be a public we can offer oh. is to help people realize their full potential that's what really excites me using what i know to do it for others yeah so that was public information see how many people were there there was there would be one person in the public information center maybe two in the whole day it was there was never like 20 people in that room at the same time ever Aaron Hubbard, our founder, made a number of breakthroughs when he was based in London. In the a clear no, no, no. Scientology's fundamentals of thought here, <laughs> which is one of the books of Scientology. He had an office on Fitzroy Street, and there's a number of lectures where you hear him talking in London. That's something that makes you very proud, because you know that we are carrying on that legacy in our city. Our church is located on Queen Victoria Street in what's called the Square Mile, also known as the City of London. We'll give you a job. And now we're going to get like 10 minutes of information about London that has nothing to do with Scientology. Start with what's yep. called the City. Or I think the uh, the tourist board for the City of London should uh, sue Scientology, actually. This. <laughs> <laughs> it's defamation. <laughs> you, you Brits are a litigious people, I, I hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it makes the city look bad that there's a church of Scientology in it. <laughs> Not only that, but that this, look, this is like trying to pass itself off as if it's like the tourism board. Yeah. <laughs> And outside of that, you have 32 boroughs. The city of London has its own rules, regulations, it has its own police force. It's definitely run separate to Greater London. It's where you've got your big banks, the big corporate organizations. Hustle and Yeah, because you can get away with more fraud and financial crimes. But that's what people in chat are saying too, essentially. Yeah, that's why Scientology's there. <laughs> Right in the heart of the city of Look how empty it is, right? An org is meant to be located in a busy part of a city, right? The whole point, there's a whole policy on the location of a church. You're meant to have a lot of footfall so that you can drag people in off the street because it's in a busy area. Look how many people are not on this street. It's such <laughs> no, a all dead of them, road. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this is evidence that they are not applying Scientology policy, but no one will ever see that. That's a Scientologist. They won't put those. They won't put two and two together. Well, they obviously blocked off the street for filming. Well, that's right. Yeah, that's what they. That's that. That makes. That's probably not, but that's what the Scientology people would tell you. I'm sure. Yeah. He was part of the parish. The City of London has such a history and tradition. We have the Lord Mayor who. Every year they are elected to office and then the day after there's the Lord Mayor's Parade, which has been going on That looks stupid. Century. <laughs> Dumb Mardi Gras. 
the route goes right in front of the church, which is very special for us. So there's always crowds outside. Yeah, but crowds that don't go into the church. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that uh, the, one of the marching bands going by should play their own rendition of that MC Lars song we play at the beginning of the <laughs> show. Or We Stand Tall. <laughs> yeah. That's our alternate intro. We stand on oh, that new one that's like nine and a half years long. Where they do like backflips and shit. Behind me, you can see St. Paul's Cathedral, one of the. Look, a real church! In London. The ground that it was built on was consecrated, so it's official religious ground. It's very well. Unlike the Church of Scientology. Special events and religious ceremonies. You know, Princess Diana and Charles were married there. The Queen had her jubilee celebrated there. See, this is the thing. What they're trying to do is say Scientology London is so spectacular and so special because it's right next door to a building that's special. <laughs> <laughs> our, it's, our place is great because you can walk around the corner to a place that people actually go. Yeah, <laughs> you can go to an actual real church where great things happen <laughs> if you go well, next door. I mean, I guess people may have people may have different uh, different ideas about the Queen's Jubilee, but it's certainly well attended. Yeah, <laughs> you could stand here and watch other people have fun. <laughs> yeah. so, it sounds like a very dreary event, actually. The Jubilee, like if you if you if you fart, they probably kick you out. Yeah, well, this is the thing. You can if you you can go to this big religious ceremony at St Paul's Cathedral and spend zero pounds and have a whole great day of it. That's all broadcast on TV and everything. Or you can go to the Church of Scientology and be interrogated and like spend money doing so. Right, <laughs> you pay them for the privilege of of yeah of interrogating <laughs> you. No fun. <laughs> no wine. <laughs> Cathedral, and it's definitely Catholics at least have wine. Architecture. Most of the city of London was actually destroyed in 1666 in the Great Fire of London. Oh, this is Tracy. God. And as a result of this, Sir Christopher Wren. He so, Tracy is the director of special affairs. She's in charge of OSA at London Org now. There's two of them, Tracy and Stefania. Um, and Tracy is one of the uh, moodiest, grumpiest people I've ever had the displeasure of meeting. Damn. New churches, <laughs> including St. Paul's Cathedral. So where we are located as a church, it has a very long religious background. Looks like a hotel. It was originally built in <laughs> Is that the Fairmont? The first function was the British and Foreign Bible Society. It looks like a bank. was to take the Bible and translate it into many different languages and then disseminate it internationally. I bet all those translations were Over perfect. Two years meticulously restoring the building and taking... No, it didn't look like this before. It looks terrible now. <laughs> the way it looked like that before. Looks like a kitchen and bathroom remodel but store, <laughs> but for the whole building. <laughs> for the whole building. history in the city of London. I always wanted to make a change. I've always wanted to have an impact on people and a positive impact. After doing courses here, I realized that Scientology was actually what I was looking for. Being a Londoner and being a Scientologist really allows me to help the people who come here. And the ability of being able to do it through my job on a daily basis is fantastic. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. <laughs> Ooh, now another commercial for themselves. A Scientology. Oh, those are chemtrails. Exclusive. <laughs> yeah, of course it's an exclusive. Timeless Discoveries comes an extraordinary series answering the question, what is Scientology? Learn its philosophies, the controversies, 
and the ground. Oh, you don't learn shit about the controversies on this channel. The global movement. That'd be great if they had whole hit pieces on like Anderson Cooper and shit on this channel. That'd be very funny. Hubbard Library presents Thursdays at eight on Scientology Network. Whether it's about enhancing, we can skip the ads if you want. It's up to you. Or with family. Does this does it let you do that? Oh, it does. Yeah. You see the like the yet when you hover over the bar, the yellow bits Those of the ads. Tell you that there are no maps. Eternal. There's a little skip button on the on the right hand side above yeah, the timestamp. Oh. Oh, cool. But we're there now. That you said you don't watch the Scientology channel, and you wondered how we do that. Seem like the I fucking this expert. In preparation. Busted. <laughs> I'd say like. People that I know, people generally speaking, I don't think they drive around London because there's a lot of traffic. That's true. I like buses because, you know, we have the double-decker bus, the red ones, and really feel like, oh my gosh, I'm in one of those buses. The buses are sort of like, you know, you feel pretty safe, a big giant thing. What's scary is cycling and undercutting a bus when you could get squished. Obviously, right. I would advise sticking to the laws of the land. Yeah, so that's really controversial. The fact that he smiled when he said that, because when I was on staff with him, there was a member of staff who did exactly that, and she undercut a bus and got squished and passed away, and it was a very tragic, horrible accident. So when he says that, like with a little smirk, you got to be careful, you don't get squished. He's saying that because he knows someone that did get squished. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Fuck Charlie Wackley. Wakely, Wackley. <laughs> Wackley. Feels like you're on a roller coaster. Of course, Wackley. My Fucking favorite whack. place in London to take people is the West End. The West End is where you have the most well-known musical theatre shows in London. We are right now near Charing Cross in the West End. We have some pretty big theatres around. There's the Harry Potter just there. Over there we have Aladdin, which is a great show. I've actually been to see it. This is another instance of look at all this other shit that you could do uh, if <laughs> yeah. we let you leave when you come visit our org. Yeah, it's also, like this sort of stuff in London that you won't see because if you're on staff, you won't have the time to go and do any of this. So make sure you've seen all of this before you come to the church. <laughs> yeah. Half Blood Prince was shit till we walked out before the intermission even happened. It was so bad. <laughs> it was so bad. by Michael Jackson that he learned one of these. Well, what do you, what do you, I mean, like, whatever, dance, fuck okay. it. <laughs> the orange chaos is destroying something. I'll be right back. I got to embrace them. I got to perform them. He had a big influence in me as a dancer. So it was great. Pete Jensen just said, Charlie will smile to your face whilst writing a KR on you. That's exactly what he did. This is a very famous That's his job, I bet. Entertainers will have a lot of mime artists who will just stand and maybe just stay there for hours without moving. I've done many flash mobs here where People like to propose to their partners. Luckily, no one has said no. So far, everyone said yes. So it's been great. One of the best things about the people, somebody in my chat, is sponsored by Palantir. It's like I'd be so good at writing, uh, writing uh, KRs. I should join. I've been lucky enough to do many great things as a performer, which basically involves the art of street dance and theatre. It's very hard as a as a dancer when you know you try and formulate that as a career because you know there's a lot of people saying to you you can't do that that's not a real career you need to get a proper job when i first came into yeah like the church of scientology is not a proper yeah, job is it <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is like the most people who that i know who work in entertainment have a what they would call a proper job and are musicians at night or you know producers hmm. djs make videos streamers it's only a very few of us that are lucky and or stupid enough to try to do like entertainment uh for a living especially as independents so <laughs> like yeah dude yeah dude most most dancers in london are probably like not professional full-time dancers yeah that's yeah 
Also, can you go back a second? Because there's a little clip that's quite funny. You know how I was saying about it was um, about all the things are staged, right? So Graham, who's the old guy that was the core supervisor at, at London Org, there's a clip here where you can see him sat down studying a course pretending to be a member of the public but in the next clip you see him walking through the same course room delivering the course <laughs> one of the best things about dance is being able to <coughs> earn a living from something that you love and you have a passion about and you know it's your everyday thing i've been lucky enough to do many great things as a performer which basically involves the art of street dance and theater It's very hard as a as a dancer when you know you try and formulate that as a career because you know there's a lot of people saying to you you can't do that that's not a real career you need to get a proper job when i first came into scientology so pause right so mm -hmm. that so that guy there on the left sat down with the white shirt on is graham who's the guy we saw in literally the shop before walking through the course room as a supervisor <laughs> and now he's sat there doing a course the ups and downs course, which was the life improvement course that I did, gave me a lot of knowledge on why you're up and down and all these things that I've been dealing with in my industry all over these years. And now, as a Scientologist, it's just completely different because you know about the ability that you possess as an individual and it just makes a massive difference. To go on the London Underground, it's so surreal. And you literally feel like you're in a tunnel. That's why, you know, it's called... Because, because you, are. you are in a tunnel. Yeah, yeah. it's very much because a tunnel. Always find me. <laughs> Pretty much. There's just always something that you haven't seen before. Town Court Road is a very busy road in London. Famous in the Harry Potter books. Shoppers, tourists, workers, everyone buzzing up and down that street all the time. That's why we have so this is where the org used to be. So you know what I'm saying about the org has to be somewhere that's busy, right? This is the old org. And then they moved to this new building, which is the one we've seen up until now, in the middle of nowhere, completely off policy. But this is now like a bookshop, basically. And this is where we would get people, where I said that we would get people in off the street and we'd kind of go to the park and say, hey, can you make this building look busy? There are usually maybe two or three staff members in this entire building. And you'll see in all of these shots, it's filled up to the brim all the time. And there's course rooms that are filled up with people. Those course rooms were literally used for storage. There was no one in any of those rooms <laughs> at all, ever. It has spaces for people just to come in and find out about Scientology. And a lot of people, there's hundreds of people going in there every week. No, maybe. London for my childhood was like this crazy, exciting place. It was like a whole adventure. I'd describe London as a very creative place. If you go around anywhere, pretty much, you're gonna have museums, galleries. You've got very famous recording studios. Any aspiring artist. Oh, Abbey Road Studio should fucking sue them too. Studios, you know, just, <laughs> you know who, who recorded in this room, you know? When we talk about London and we talk about music, we talk about the Abbey Road Studios, the world famous. He had the likes of the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, you know, having recorded there. Yeah, absolutely. So this is Abbey Road, and as you can see, that's the world famous Zebra Crossing, otherwise known as the Zebra Crossing. Uh, and it, it was made famous uh, on the uh, the Beatles album in the '60s. I want to make a funny image of like Andy Nolch and like, uh, and I won't name any more names. Any of our like disgraced anti Scientology people, but have them walking across this road. <laughs> just, it's 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 the competition between the the crowd and, and the cars. Yeah, that is fake Beatles music they're playing right here is pretty fucking good, actually sponsored by Palantir, because it's supposed to sound like the Beatles. <laughs> I really love working with bands and recording them. I love, uh, yeah, I love, I love music. I love if it, if it, if something. So a Scientologist somewhere else watching this who doesn't really know what's going on might think this guy works at Abbey Road Studio. Yeah, he's he's a member of the public. He's a I think he's a like a producer or something for his own company. 
But they're making it seem like he works for Abbey Road. He's not. He does mu- produce music, but he's just a paying member of the public who's been lied to and tricked by the Church of Scientology. I'll work with it, you know. <laughs> um, I also do live band recordings. I was traveling around and I, I was I was becoming quite successful in, you know, it just, it, it all fell flat. I didn't, you know, I, I, I just I lost the purpose. I felt I wasn't able to work at my true potential. Scientology has given me so much more confidence than I used to have. Well, the course- So was- what he's trying to do here is trying to make it look like Scientology is responsible for all of his success. And he was fairly successful when he joined Scientology. And now Scientology are taking his money for courses that make him feel like he's more successful but he's just as successful as he always has been like it's not like he apl- he was doing terribly and then scientology ma- made him more productive and now he's a millionaire no his his business hasn't changed <laughs> right he's uh, a vi- and again he's a victim they probably they, they probably yeah. recruited him i would assume because he was yeah a music producer yeah there's a policy that is, i think it's just called the celebrity or something and the policy is to recruit celebrities, people who are musicians, actors, sort of talent, that are either on their way up and about to reach their peak or have just passed their peak. That's the policy is get them just before or just after, because that's when they're at their most vulnerable. Because if they're about to reach their peak, then you can claim Scientology made them famous. And if they've passed their peak, then you can kind of get them and say, hey, we can restore your fame and glory. And then, like, for a lot of the people that have just passed their peak, as soon as they find out that the cult of Scientology doesn't like how much blow they do, they're probably like, this isn't for me, sorry. (laughs) For me, it was was just a a huge, real win to realize that I actually wasn't that good at communicating (laughs) before the course. And I thought I was. The great thing about Scientology is is that I, I, that I've I've learned to really sort of you know be in the moment and to really kind of experience it and so even though there might be things going on in my head or whatever it's really kind of being here for for you know for the band and really just communicating. He's really struggling to find his words there. <laughs> the people is probably the thing that makes London special. We really feel proud to be Londoners and there's a certain character to people that have grown up and lived in London. There's not one Londoner that I've met that doesn't have stories to tell from their childhood or from their life. You know, they've led interesting lives. Oh, yes. Famously, people outside of London who have no stories about their lives. Yeah, including him. Like all of these staff members all at the time lived in East Grinstead and traveled up every morning to work in the London org and then travel back down. Charlie now lives just around the corner from me. They do all live in London now. But at the time, (laughs) they're all from outside London. Those bad tell me indicator. Some think they can buy it. Some think they can wear it. Some I say, I still know all the words to all of these ads. It's bad. Some travel the world in search of it. Most don't even know what they're looking for. But for the low price of three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> We're not good at food, but if you haven't been to London in the last 10 years, you are missing out. No, ma'am, you are probably not good at food. But <laughs> Other people in London. It's kind of pies and mash and fish and chips, but actually the most popular dish is chicken tikka masala, which is like an Indian curry that was actually invented in the United Kingdom, not in India. It's kind of like a mild curry because us Brits don't have it so spicy. Ultimately, my favourite food is a good Sunday roast, British style, with a Yorkshire pudding, because otherwise it's not proper. It's drenched in this like thick, luxurious brown gravy. You gotta do something to the beef you just boiled. (laughs) Traditional, classic British meal that you get. What also makes London unique is how multicultural it is. 
You can literally walk down the street and you meet people from all walks of life, all cultures. Speaking. Man, man, that's called a city. There's always something mm, yeah. Yeah. that you can learn by just speaking to someone. It's been cosmopolitan for thousands of years, dating back to Roman times. London was like the centre because we had the river, the boats would come. So it was very interracial and very tolerant. And over the years, we've learned to live with each other and we've learned about each other's traditions, each other's religions, each other's cultures. Yeah, as long as you're not an anti-Scientologist. If you're an ex or anti-Scientologist, get out. We don't want you here. It really opens our doors to other religions, other like-minded community groups. We have a huge amount of different community programs, so human rights education. Oh, no, 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 no. These are not community programs. They're called front groups. <laughs> They're front groups, sir. DJ who came through our doors, and then he found out about our program, which is the way to happiness. He started playing it on his radio station. Okay, what's really funny about this, right, is just before we went live, I was looking this up. I was like, Omega FM, I've never even heard of it. Just look on their website, that's all I'll say. Like, the navigation bar is covered up with a picture. It's It plays, like, really old, crappy recordings of music. Like, it sounded like someone was at a kid's party with, like, a $10 microphone that, and just holding it up to all of the noise, and that's what was being played on the radio. <laughs> so graphic design, uh, web design, and um, high-quality audio is, is their passion. <laughs> Clearly. Thanks to Scientology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this guy could have been a fucking rocking ass DJ if it weren't for Scientology. <laughs> this guy would be on tour with this guy would be on tour with like Diplo or something if he wasn't if he would have joined a cult. He would fucking ruined yeah. this guy. Amiga Radio. And Amiga stands for organizing mothers and men to eradicate gun and knife atrocities. Oh, that's a backronym. Get the fuck out of here. There are way more letters in that acronym than Omega. <laughs> If you can change one person, you can change two. If you can change two, you can change five. You can transform your community. What is my arm? When we have the Olympics, we had a huge campaign to educate people on the effects of... Oh, you, made, you, you put a bunch of paper trash all over the place during the Olympics. Thanks, Scientology. ...about the truth about drugs. <laughs> Like we filled up fucking so 500 that garbage lady cans. Knows Natalie, that's Charlie's mum. Approached the Olympians as they were walking in, or they were talking. That's Nikki, who's Kate's sister on the left. Support having a drug-free world. Does Tracy uh, have a cupcake shop somewhere? <laughs> a happier person. Oh, that looks like Pete Buttigieg's fucking older brother or something. Look at that guy. Every person we achieve <laughs> that with, it makes a difference in the community. It's a it's a ripple effect. See, this is the thing. They're saying, look, we're doing all this great stuff and we went out and we, we told people the truth about drugs and it's going to benefit the community. No, what they did is they stood outside a shopping centre with a giant piece of paper and asked kids, will you sign this to say that you're never going to do drugs? And they go, yeah, OK. They write their name on it. And then that's it. They take it back and go, look at how wonderful we've changed the community. <laughs> no, you've just... <laughs> that's not getting people off drugs. <laughs> I'm just thinking of like the fucking, I mean, how many trash bags full of fucking the truth about drugs flyers end up getting picked up at the end of these events. They're supposed to be saving the world and shit. And all they're doing is fucking printing out a bunch of shit for people to throw away. Yeah. I used to give these things out. I, there was a part of the, one of these campaigns. We used to go to shops and there was a little display unit where we'd have like 20 booklets and I'd go into a shop as a 15 year old kid and be like, hey, I'm trying to stop people do drugs. Can I can I put these information booklets on your counter and you can just give them out to people for free? And like most shopkeepers are going to be like, yeah, OK, cool. You're a kid. Yeah, do what you want. As long as it doesn't cost us anything. <laughs> like, I and then, like, do get out of here. Yeah, and then literally an hour later or whatever, someone would have come in and chucked the whole thing in the bin. But <laughs> I could go back and I could claim I've given out 20 booklets because you've just put them on the desk somewhere. Doesn't mean 20 people have read them and understood them. T minus, thank you for giving out a gift sub there to X1011. Someone tried to charge me for one of those booklets one time. That's off policy. The truth about drugs booklets should be free. Well, 
so it was at the flea market and right at the entrance slash exit there was a scientology tent and they had i don't know what book it was but it was in a bunch of different languages and i was like oh this is cool and the only reason it was cool is because i'm like something uh, one like this look like that but it was a different subject yes but it was something like that and um oh, i was with jeremiah i was with jeremiah monster that's right and so i picked it up and i looked at it, i'm like oh i can read you know passages of this on the show or whatever and I walked off with it, and this dude, like, chased me down. He was like, we're supposed to charge you for those, but you were so smooth about it, and you just walked off that I just am going to go ahead and give it to you. And I'm like, oh, great. And then I'm going to make this kid scrub the bathroom with a toothbrush later for, like, $3 pamphlet that I stole from Scientology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, these are from the Scientology Handbook, which is a big, thick book that's supposed to cover all of the basic topics of Scientology. Um, and these count as a, a book sale. So if I sold one of these for four, this is what we used to do, right? So a, a Dianetics book was at the time thirteen pounds. So, but my book stat was number of books sold, right? So if I had a friend, and so say my stats were I sold fifty books, I need to sell fifty-one books next week, otherwise I'm in trouble. And say it was just before Thursday at two, which is the cutoff deadline for stats, right? What and I was 10 books short. Instead of finding 10 people to spend 13 pounds on Dianetics, I'd find one friend and get them to buy 10 of these booklets for a pound each because then I get 10 book sales, even though it's a cheaper amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, but we were supposed to charge for these, yeah. Well, good on Media Wench for. <clears throat> I wonder, wonder what happened to that guy. I hope, he, I hope they didn't fucking uh, Lisa McPherson him. Who knows? You should scan it in. I personally wanted to do something that gave back to the community. Just knowing that I can help other people feels good when I get up in the morning. If I can help just one person, it's the most satisfying. Thing. That's Felix. He's a staff member. Like I've seen people change their lives dramatically from using Scientology to help themselves and yeah my life that, changed dramatically I was kind of in the shitter fun. anyway but then I did Scientology and I got even worse <laughs> years. to have a team around you that helps you and then helps that individual to overcome those things I've certainly never observed that same spirit anywhere else Oh, uh, uh, sponsored by uh, Palantir. You're talking about Reckless Ben. Remember when they told? The, remember when he claimed that he stole his fucking roommate's Xbox to pay for mm -hmm. Scientology? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were they were sort of ambivalent about whether or not that was okay to do. It was very funny. <laughs> yeah. Extremely proud of being able to make a change in London. It's in the name, you know. Like you don't have to say much more. It's an incredible city. It's unique because you meet people from all walks of life and I absolutely love preserving that and continuing it through the ages. This is all the same footage they already showed. Uh-huh. Oh, and the rest of this is just ads. Yep. For themselves. <laughs> <laughs> that was good that was good you got to you got to see all the people that you uh didn't smoke weed with when you were a teenager <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh it's it's weird it's sad in a way but it's also kind of i don't because these are all people i spent so much time with there's a lot of memories and a lot of like good stuff but there's also a lot of bad stuff and it's also kind of i look back and i go look these guys are still in and you know my heart goes out to them because they, I have found the light or whatever you want to call it and, and read the truth. And I'm aware of the abuses and the horrible things that go on. These guys are still, they don't even know they're being lied to. And that's what motivates me when I go protest was try and make them aware. Look, help is available. We're here to support you as a community. You know, you know me as a person, you know, I'm not an evil suppressive person. But that's what the Church of Scientology are telling you I am. So just think outside the box, you know. Hopefully we can get them out, but I doubt it will ever happen. I mean, not all of them, but I, you know, I think, uh, I think being visible, like, outside of their, being visible with, like, numbers and, like, like organized and stuff is probably, probably plants a seed in somebody's mind.
well, all you can hope for. That was that was fantastic. It was a good to, good to get some uh, the inside dirt, let's say, on the, the Scientology org. So we found Charlie Wackley. Um, just they were doing YouTube videos for a while. I don't know if you re- remember that the London that org was, was doing my... YouTube videos. I think it was him and his wife that were doing them. I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, and those were a little cringe, and they're gone now. I think that was all my doing. It was my my. Um campaign my idea to make charlie a bit of a social media star and say hey we should be using social media to sell dianetics and to introduce people to scientology so i came up with a social media plan and started all the accounts and everything and i i left and then he carried on with it all very very but, cool is, so is it's it... my fault you know charlie i'm sorry <laughs> no no it isn't we 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 found him uh beforehand well i guess so yeah it is your fault all right well <laughs> well whatever um <clears throat> do you th- and this is the, this is gonna this is you know I'm gonna be asking you to kind of wildly speculate. Do you think that guy's on his way up in the organization? Uh, he's now the deputy executive director. So he's the second in charge. In Wait, London. what? Yeah, we were calling him Scientology Twink for a while. <laughs> <laughs> What's he doing in charge of anything? He so he so I was director of public book sales. He was the public executive secretary. So he was in he was my senior, my boss. And then he got promoted to deputy executive director. So yeah, he's the second most senior person in the org. Oh, that's, I mean, I would say good for him, but I, that's not actually how I feel about it. <laughs> His um, brother, um, Char- um, so Charlie's brother, Jason, is in the Sea Org. He's over in LA um, and he works in ethics. And he's the guy that kicked me out, actually. And then his other brother, Matt, is, or he was a core supervisor. So he's the... His brother is higher up than he is, but um, but he's the highest in the org. Huh. Very nice. We have something from the soundboard. Some people are more bottom than others. Well, we took up a little <laughs> more of your time than uh, we had thought we were going to. That's the way it always goes with all our guests, though. No, it's I, so good. I wanted to. I wanted to thank you uh, for joining us and uh, tell thank everybody I, we should have done this at the beginning. Where where should these people look for you? Because I know you're not here on Twitch. I'm not on Twitch, but I'm on YouTube. Apostate Alex is my name, and I'm on Twitter and Instagram and all that, all that good stuff. But uh, but yeah, I do content mostly talking about um, talking to ex Scientologists and about their experiences, and um, yeah, following the money. I do a lot of um, investigation and stuff on my blog, which is ScientologyBusiness.com. If you're interested in the fraud and all that sort of stuff and what's going on in Europe, check it out. I'll be there. 